Are you unmuted? No. Now I am. Now you're unmuted. Yay. Sorry, everyone. A bit of a gong show getting this going. You had a teleconference that went right to the last second, and I uh, had to install some additional software on my computer that I had recently wiped. So. Yeah, and and I have to admit, if you see me somewhat distracted, uh, we're filming this, filming this, we're recording this, uh, the day of the Boston Marathon, and Boston's my hometown, and there's been reports of explosions in one of the places I used to love to hang out. Um, so I'm trying to keep track of making sure my friends are all tw checking in on Twitter. Do some of them run marathons? Yeah, actually, a few do. Wow, okay. Um... All right, so uh, so for anyone who has never, has en no idea what they've stumbled into, we're going to be doing a live episode of Astronomy Cast, which is our weekly uh, space and astronomy podcast. Uh, so this week's episode, episode 296, is actually going to be getting a three, maybe four, part series on space stations. Well, I'll explain it, Pamela, you look confused. So, so part one... I, I knew nothing of this four well, I knew well, of three. I, follow, you know what, follow along my mental calculations and I think you'll like it. So, um, so part one is going to be uh, Skylab and Salyut. So we'll talk about the, the origins of space stations and up to the point uh, sort of after the Apollo program, and this is going to be the next Great Hope. Part two, which is going to be next week, uh, we're going to talk about the Mir space station and sort of other space station ideas that, that didn't make it off the ground in that time frame. Uh, space station freedom. Freedom, yeah. So sort of that, the, the 80s, the Cold War space stations. And then uh, we're going to talk about, for part three, we'll talk about the International Space Station and a bit of the, uh, about the Chinese space station, the Tiangong. Um, which are up there right now. Uh, and then I was thinking for fourth, I would just love to talk about the cool, like, great space station ideas that never happened and sort of, you know, like, talk about the kinds of space stations that have been proposed into the future. So that that's all Maybe I'm thinking. Maybe the space stations of science fiction? Yeah, yeah, but even just, like, so the, you know, the cool rings that are rotating. And, yeah, but and... I'm looking for an excuse to discuss Babylon 5 here. That would be great. Yeah, no, so that's what I'm saying. Like, like I always... The thing is, is that, you know, as we report on this stuff, we see so many great proposals for ideas that never get built. And there's no reason, apart from them being incredibly expensive and complicated, but, you know, in paper, they're a really great idea. It would be really cool to build a ring around the entire sun. No. Example. No, I know. It wouldn't be stable. It wouldn't work. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I just think it would be, uh, it would be, it would be cool to just talk about some of the the more the the theoretical ideas. So that's what I was thinking for a fourth fourth episode. Um, yeah, so we'll take about half an hour to, to do the show, and then when we finish, uh, depending on how much uh, brain power Pamela has left, we will stick around for you know fifteen twenty minutes and answer some questions that you might have about space and astronomy. So there's a few places you can do this. Uh, the first place is you can comment uh, if you're just watching this embedded somewhere out on the interwebs. You can uh, just use the hash on Twitter. You can use the hashtag AstronomyCast. If you are watching this uh, on the event page on Google+, you can make, definitely make a comment there, and I'm tracking that. Uh, if you're watching this in my feed or maybe some reshare of that, hopefully, but that's very dangerous. I'll just warn you that you know the more you get reshares, it's harder for me to track those comments all go the time. Go to YouTube. Time. That's yeah, the, the best safe place. place. Yeah, absolutely. The safe place is to go in and do this on YouTube and, and, uh, and make comments there, and we will absolutely. That's baked right into the, the Hangout now that we're, we're using, so we'll be able to see that. Um, in fact, I don't even have my stream one. I'm not tracking that at all. That was a total lie. Um, so let me just grab that, and then, and then I won't be a liar about this. You all just heard me say a boot, didn't you? It happens. Uh, um, no, no, I, I'm proud of my Canadian accent. Uh, okay. Awesome. So now I've got all the stream. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. Are you uh, are you in a state of readiment? As as ready as I can be. Given I need to turn off Twitter. Sorry. Normally yeah, well, I would track. Really? Twitter are you the gonna show. try and do a show while you're watching Twitter? Normally I track our comments on Twitter, but our comments on Twitter are getting interleaved with too many about the Boston explosions. Sorry, folks. You're getting to watch me have craziness today. Okay, I'm done now. Okay. Off. All right. 
Um, okay, well, let me know when you want to press record. Um, I am pressing record. I am monoed. I pressed it twice, which means that it started and stopped. That was okay, dumb. I'll kill mine and we'll start again. I'm pressing it again, and it's recording correctly. Mine is also recording correctly. Perfectly. It's nice and stable, like Audacity always is. All right. Um, I'll give you, always give you a hard time. Okay. There we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 296 for Monday, March 4th, 2013. Space Stations, part one. Skylab and Salyut. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evertsville. Hi, hey, Pamela. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing really well. Do we have any announcements? Um, we are still advertising our classes at mm -hmm. CosmoQuest. Um, so if you would like to take a course either on stellar astronomy with Ray Sanders, our own dear astronomer, or a class on cosmology with author and PhD uh, Matthew Francis, uh, you can sign up for those at CosmoQuest.org slash classes. I, I would also ask that all of you pay attention right now to what's going on with education funding in America. There is currently a movement to remove education funding from NASA, which means no more mission dollars being sent, spent to help educate kids about the latest discoveries coming out of spacecraft, Hubble, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, Messenger. And if these programs matter to you, contact the White House, which is where all of this is starting and con contact your senators and your congressmen and I say that as a independent citizen and someone working as a volunteer on CosmoQuest. All right. Yeah, no, I think this is going to impact, I don't know if it's going to, how, how and where it's going to impact us, but I think we're already starting to see the crunch with a lot of the people that we work with, a lot of the, uh, the programs and the missions that we talk to. They, have, they all have a lot of outreach, a lot of educational stuff, and so that will be too bad to see that go. We've all been asked to assume zero budget starting in 2014. My team here at CosmoQuest, we're desperately trying to raise money, and we've pledged that any money that we raise beyond what we need for our own salaries, we'll use to contract people who lose their jobs in this, and people are losing their jobs in this. Yeah. So if you can give, we will do what we can to keep the excellent EPO going beyond what governmental budgets allow. Right. Um, okay, great. So let's get on with the show then. Um, okay, so it's one thing to fly into space and another thing entirely to live in space. And to understand the stresses and strains this puts on a human body, you're going to need a space station. In this three-part series, we explore the past, present, and future of stations in space, starting with the American Skylab and Russian Salyut stations. Uh, and I actually decided before we even did this show that I, I almost want to turn this into a four-part series. So, so in addition to the three parts, you know, talking about the uh, the the Skylab and the Salyut, you know, the the Apollo era space stations, and then talk about the sort of Cold War, the Mir, and other programs, the Freedom things that didn't happen, uh, and then we'll talk about the ISS and sort of the the Chinese, the Tiangong uh, space station. But I also love to talk about sort of the future, the the, the space stations that didn't happen science fiction space stations and sort of the future of space stationery. So uh, I think that would be that would be really cool. So maybe this will turn into a four-part uh, trilogy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that was a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. I hope you got that. Uh, yes, right. Uh, so then, uh, so let's talk about the, the, the space stations. And I guess before we even kind of get cracking on this, let's, let's kind of, you know, what is, what is a space station? I... <laughs> At a certain level, it is nothing more than a containment vessel for humans that is incapable of, of getting to space on its own, but is, is either deposited there or built there and then abandoned there to die as humans come back on a different vehicle. And I guess you could imagine, I mean, it's uh, even like a, uh, a space suit is almost like a mini space station when you're out in space without you know, a rocket that you can use to fly to and from Earth, you know. Although but, there's the potential to build space suits that allow you to re-enter through the atmosphere without death, space stations just die on re-entry. Whoa. Yeah. That, that would be like the Felix Baumgartner, but 
times a thousand. That would think, be something. Think Star Trek or uh, An Old Man's War by John Scalzi. Yep. That sort of stuff, that that could happen in our future. Wow, There's okay. people working on it. We just tangented. Um, all right, so, okay, so, so the point being that, you know, a rocket, you know, a space shuttle, a capsule, these are the kinds of spacecraft that are going to fly, you know, they're going to launch on board a rocket, they're going to get up into space, and they're designed to re-enter again. Space station, you put it up in orbit, you leave it there, it's not going anywhere. Right. You can um, move it a little bit to avoid junk, but can't move it very much. Right, right, okay. And so then... You know, what was the the first space station that was sort of planned and and I guess eventually launched? I guess well, we the, these were go ahead. The these were the Soviet uh, spacecraft, the Almaz series, which were also called the Salyut series, depending on if you were uh, a military person in the know or you were a civilian person not in the know. Uh, these these three missions, uh, the the first one to successfully launch was Salyut two, and it went up in April of 1973. So we've actually had space stations longer than we've had well me. So this these these things date back a long time, and these initial three space stations, uh, Salyut two, three, and five, these were actually reconnaissance platforms that were put up there by the Soviets to basically be manned spy stations and it was realized uh, in in the late 1970s when when Salyut uh, 5 ended in 1977 that um, there were better ways to monitor other parts of the world like unmanned spaceships uh, right. our spy satellites are, are much better than humans and cheaper too and so, I mean, these space stations were all devised and launched after the big moon race Right. You know, so the the Apollo program ended, and the the Soviets' attempt to la to land uh, people on the on the moon as well had had wrapped up. And then, as the next appropriate step was, let's put some humans into space and have them stay there for long periods of time. And and with the Alamaz space stations, these first three Salyuts, uh, they they were put up there, really as a way of starting the tech that we still use today. There's a module on the International Space Station that still uses uh, designs that are, of course, upgraded, but are still based on the original Almu's command consoles and designs. And so these were very rugged, rigorous systems. We don't see systems left over from Skylab, for instance, still going into the International Space Station. We had to start from scratch. So there's a lot to be said for building something that could undergo that slow, continual upgrades, but had a core design that was pretty much eternal. It's the little black dress of spaceships. And, and right, and they, they were designed to be docked with Soyuz, Soyuz capsules carrying crew. They were designed to have progress uh, cargo capsules. I mean, this is the same thing. You, you could have written one of these articles that a a Soyuz has launched to the space station, uh, and a Progress vehicle has launched the space station and has docked and has transferred crew and cargo and stuff. And you can have like, this conversation now, 40 years later, and it would still be completely appropriate, right? Exactly the yeah. same. And and so while while the original Almuz Almaz, I'm not. It's, it's a Russian name, and I'm still not entirely sure how to pronounce it. That doesn't usually happen, but no, today it's going words. to. Yep. Um, it means diamond. Um, so while the first three were coincident with, with the Salyut program and, and were simply top secret, not talked about things, uh, their core design ended up getting reused in uh, spacecraft in the 80s and 90s that had uh, major ra radar um, deployments on board. So again, it was a neat way to take this technology. Not only were they able to take it and reuse use it in building the ISS so many decades later, but they were able to use it in the 80s unmanned to build uh, radar satellites. Now, when I think about Soviet space uh, flight launches and Mars landings and moon landings, and especially the stuff with the Venera program, there's a lot of failure. Oh, yeah. so, so how did they do with their, with their spacecraft? Well, they did pretty stations. well in the grand. <laughs> they did pretty well in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Salyut one didn't quite make it up to space, but it was unmanned. There wasn't death involved, except of of a empty shell of a spacecraft. Um, 
then two and three were fine. Um, I actually have to admit I have no clue what happened to number four. Uh, Salute five was fine, and then they didn't launch uh, Salute uh, six. So, are you are you sure? Sorry to pull out of this. I'm just looking on so Salute six seventy seven to eighty one sixteen crews. Uh, okay, sorry. I'm on. The, I'm looking at the Almu stuff, and yeah. it, so it's OPS four. I think we should, didn't I think we should fly. redo this. If you go down, okay. where it says list of space stations. Okay, we're looking at two different sources. Is the problem? Yeah. Yeah. I'm still looking at the the military ones, and there's an unmanned military mm. one, and it looks like they're renamed. Yeah. That okay. Was the D, yeah. That was the, the DOS. That was the do, the dose two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so OPS-4 is the one that didn't fly, and then they used the name Salute-4 for Dose-4. Okay, yeah. sorry everyone, you get to see what happens when different people are looking at different sites. Yep. Okay. So, so I just yes. asked you sorry, of the history of the, uh, of the space stations, and then you know we can take it from there. Okay, the history of the space... So the, okay, which you know, ones blew up is what you actually asked Which ones blew up? About. Yeah, yeah. Which ones blew up? Right? How did they? <laughs> how did they fail? And how bad? Like okay, that? so so Salyut one uh, didn't quite make it, but no one died. It was unmanned. They were launching the the space station when it ceased to exist. Uh, Salyuts two, three, and five they did fine. Um, one of the craft that they built, OPS-4, which was set to be the next uh, in the Almo series of, of military versions of this, um, ended up not being used. But they then continued to transform this program from being a military reconnaissance with a civilian name and a military name. They transformed it to being strictly civilian and this became the Salyut program that we're all so familiar with that eventually uh, blended into becoming the Mir space station. And so this is where we pick up with Salyut 4. Salyut 4. And so what was sort of like the classic one? If you think about the, the classic Russian space station, it was like what, Salyut 6 and 7? I mean, that was when they were really... They were... It's moving back and forth and people were coming and going and there was crews and they were lasting a long time and they were pushing records. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of these things where the, the Russians, very much like the Chinese are doing today, just over and over and over kept incrementally improving what they were doing and each thing was a, a new addition. And and so I, I can't say which one's the most iconic. Salute 4 was one of the ones that, that solved the issue of having multiple crews back to back quite successfully. It it lasted a long time. Um so so it went from seventy-four to seventy-seven. Um Salute five it was again, they went back to doing military, it happens. Um but but then with Salyut 6, here, here we have uh, another one that it's multiple modules. They uh, are successfully docking and coming and going. They're starting to, to do science here. They have a 10-meter radio telescope attached. And this is one of the things that I personally find awesome is, is the International Space Station. It does some science. But, but the Soviets, they thought, what science can we do with these missions? in their early days and they were trying stuff and I have to admit you, you don't generally run across that many articles that say uh, citation salute missions this was done in outer space but but they were trying and and I, I love the fact that they were trying things like radio dishes in space um, they they were also with salute 6 they they started launching minorities well before America ever did um, so while there's a lot of bad that you can say about Soviet Russia, their space program nailed it in the 70s. And I know that, you know, with some of those missions, they had people on board that were, uh, in some cases, 140 days, 175 days. I mean, these were, and you can, when you think about, like, the Apollo missions that had gone just a, you know, maybe a, not even a decade before, People had flown up into space, landed on the moon, come back. I mean, nobody was spending more than a couple of weeks in space at the maximum, and they were, they were having people there for half a year. 
And and the the records that they sent, uh, Salute Six. It was 185 days. The, these records that they were setting, they weren't broken until we had a crew kind of stranded on Mir during the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so at various points, I mean, they weren't totally trapped. They, but it, it wasn't good, and and so it was only due to technological issues, and then later purposeful marathon trips into space that, that we saw these records getting broken on Mir. So, and, you know, while the Soviets were launching, uh, you know, really launching station after station after station, the Americans needed to get into this, into this game as well, and so that was Skylab. Right, but, but I do have to say that, that Salyut 6 had a really interesting demise before oh, we sure. go yeah, on no, to Skylab. Sure. Um, it had a mold problem. I mean, these are things that, that we don't think about. We think of the Star Trek future of everything is clean and shiny and stainless steel and Windexed surfaces. It probably wasn't Windex, but um, with, with Salyut 6, they, they ran into a mold problem that eventually led to them needing to retire the spacecraft, and um, it was deorbited due to not really being livable anymore. And... Um, of all the ways for a space station to have its life terminated, too much mold is not one I would have ever imagined. No, no. And you can just imagine, I mean, you're trapped in that environment. You have no way to get out, and you're breathing yeah. these mold spores. I can just imagine the yeah. health issues that the poor astronauts were having. I mean, there must have just been, like, water. Like, if, if their system couldn't, deal with the evaporation, you just imagine there'd be water dripping and everything it would be wet and you'd be breathing mold and there'd be this smell. I yeah. mean, it is, you know, and again, I think you're exactly right that, that when people think about space stations, they imagine the Star Trek future where you're, you know, moving around with this clean, polished uh, chrome oh. and, and, you know, and plastics and stuff. But no, I think uh, submarine is the is the way to think about it that that you boys are boys locker in a, room boys boys locker room in a submarine you know that you're yeah. in this tiny constrained space and you can't go anywhere and you're there for so long and the smell oh I think yeah, uh, yeah I think that's you know that absolutely puts it all in, into context so uh, yeah. so let's move on to to Skylab then the Americans version of this so so Skylab is is one of the the space stations that tried and just faced fail after fail after fail. Um, it, it was originally launched in 1973, but the poor thing when it launched lost a, a solar panel, lost a shield, uh, its other solar panel didn't quite open correctly, and, and so we basically ended up launching this fairly crippled um, would be spacecraft, but, but I think it was important to note that I mean it was using Apollo technology, right? Yeah. I mean, they launched it on the what the last Saturn V rocket, the very last Saturn V. So this went up in May of 1973, and and once they got it up there, I mean it, there was clearly that initial oh insert all your expletives of choice. What do we do now? And they ended up repairing it. It was wow. the first ever manned repairs on space. There's some amazing pictures of tethered astronauts climbing around on the outside of this thing, just scaffolding every... It's not scaffolding. It's, it's the frames of, of solar arrays and things like that. And this isn't something we had any practice doing. Um, and and so they they had to figure it out and and they figured out how to repair it and it wasn't quite in the right orbit um, so they did what they could with it it was originally planned that this was going to be something that lasted a very long time um, they they designed it really nicely if you're ever in Washington DC the US Air and Space Museum has a full scale mock up of, of the Skylab mission that you can walk through and wow. you can explore all the different components that it had. Um, they had exercise areas, they had science areas, they had crew, sleeping, living areas. Um, and this was where America had to decide how do we keep people in space for a long time. And because we did it all or nothing, 
it, it was one of these have to launch it all at once, where, whereas the Soviets did incremental development, building bigger and bigger and bigger things. We just did it all at once. And um, so they had to figure out how do we build a shower? How do we feed ourselves? How, how do we do a lot of things? So the focus of this mission ended up largely being how do we live in microgravity? How do we keep clean in microgravity? And, and so it's interesting to compare the, the emphasis of these two different space stations. And I know that a, a lot of the astronauts that flew on board, you know, all their names, you're going to recognize them. I mean, they yeah. were in many cases the same people that, that were, were people who went to the moon. I know the first, first commander was P. Comrade. And, and this, this was that bridging program that took us from the Apollo era, and it was supposed to lead us all the way into uh, the space shuttle era, but the space shuttle wasn't completed on time, and this in many ways is, is the great travesty for, for Skylab, because it was hoped that the space shuttle would be able to boost Skylab into a higher orbit and keep it going, and this would have allowed um, the United States to have a space station throughout the early 80s at the same time that we had the space shuttle program going. But due to a disconnect in the timing of when Skylab, frankly, ran out of orbiting ability and when the space shuttle was ready to, to fly, um, we ended up losing Skylab. So were there sort of some highlights of the, of the missions beyond the repair, which was still pretty amazing? Um, what were some of the other highlights, some of the things that happened during Skylab? Well, it, it was one of those programs where America got to spend over 180 days in space where we really tested what exercise regimes are necessary to prevent decalcification, what food can and can't be uh, consumed in space. Well, how do um, we uh, basically, how do we work on um, dealing with, this is going to sound stupid, but one of the problems that they had to figure out how to deal with was flatulence. Um, and so really this, this was a, a test in living in space. Um, and, and then it became a test in trying to understand how to safely deorbit something that big, which is something we'd never done before. This, this was basically a solid object the size of the last stage of an Apollo rocket. And that was a bit interesting to have it come back down through the atmosphere, which wasn't really something we'd planned for ahead of time. What was the strategy for that? Well, at, at a certain level, NASA wasn't entirely sure when it was going to come down, but as they watched the orbit degrade and watched the orbit degrade, um, they, they reached a point where they, they were pretty sure it was coming down in the next day or so, and they readjusted its, its alignment so that they believed that it would come down in the ocean uh, off the coast of South Africa, nice big empty space between there and Australia. Um, but this was a space station that did not want to die a fiery death, and it didn't actually disintegrate until it was 10 miles up. And they thought that it would disintegrate much higher. And because it held on for so long, it managed to actually come down uh, outside of Perth on land instead of in the ocean between South Africa and Australia. Right. So um, they had aimed it to try and, you know, it was just going to cross Africa and then it would crash into the ocean and it made it all the way around another several thousand kilometers, you know, yeah. to, to reach Australia and then land near Perth. I, and, you know, and I, I remember, I remember this. I was very young. <laughs> Do you remember this? I was. No, right. I, I have no memory of this. No. Okay. So this was 79. So I was eight. And I remember there being sort of newspapers about how, you know, everyone was freaking out that it was going to crash on their heads. And we were, you know, even in Canada, even though I don't think we were even on the, you know, we were even well, on the flight know. path. Or they weren't sure where time. it was, yeah, where yeah. it was going to land. And so everybody was worried that it was going to crash on their heads. And then, and then it ended up in, in Australia, sort of in the, in the middle well, of nowhere so in Australia, which was good. 
I, I, I would have loved to be one of the actuarial mathematicians involved in this because they actually ca calculated that there is a 1 in 152 chance that a human being would get hit with a piece of debris from this. Um, they figured that uh, there was probably a 1 in 7 chance that it was going to hit a city of 100,000 or more and NASA actually had to put together um, teams to go out and potentially help if 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 badness occurred due to the reentry, now, now there weren't toxic chemicals involved. This wasn't like some of the other incidents where we've we've had bad things fall from the sky. This was a space house falling. So this this was a rather radical version of of Dorothy and Oz. No humans on board, but the space house falling on Australia. Um. So so during that time, then I mean, I guess they had done the. Uh, they they launched and and deorbited Skylab, uh, <clears throat> and so the, and then I know there was going to be sort of a long delay before the next big big space station. Were they still planning to do any more missions as sort of part of that program? I mean, were well, they all there, of... there, yeah, there there was a bunch of Skylab missions. Um, I mean, Skylab Five was was going to the fifth crew was going to be a 20-day mission to conduct scientific experiments and try and boost it to a higher orbit. Um, it ended up not happening. Um, then Skylab B was um, a backup that never got flown. And I mean, while, while there was a detailed plan for Skylab 5, this was something that when it was originally built was supposed to last much, much longer. So while there weren't detailed plans for Skylab 6, Skylab 7, it was like that only because once they got it launched they realized they had problems. And so they stopped planning those future missions in detail. And I think at that point they had run out of a they'd run out of Saturn V rockets. They had run out of all of the the parts. I mean, they could have well, gotten. Well, the space that. shuttle was delayed. And, they, and this was something that was supposed to work with the space shuttle. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, and this is the situation that you've got, right? That you've got the space shuttle that is starting to siphon funding from the whole program and siphon engineers and you know brain power. And that was that launched in like eighty one. So you've got yeah. this this period of time when when they're having to shift over and we see this again and again as a as something becomes quite real like the James Webb Space Telescope now you can see lots and lots of of other programs having to get peeled back shut down yeah. canceled defunded so that the one mission be it curiosity or James Webb or what have you is going to get is going to get launched and that was the same situation so so I think we'll, we'll sort of wrap it up here but next week I think we're going to spend the whole show on Mir which is you know an amazing story and it's just yeah. an incredible space station and I think one space station that that both pushed and challenged what human endurance in space and also sort of revealed all of the problems that long duration space flight can can create and you know I was I was I reported on the deorbiting of, of Mir so it's definitely yeah. sort of starting to fall in my recent in my professional life so yeah and and that one's an interesting one because it was almost sold for commercial purposes and just imagine if that had happened it would have completely uh, changed space so much earlier were you in Russia during Mir um I'm trying to think you know I'm trying to remember what year Mir started I I was mm. in Russia in 89 and 91 yeah um Mir we'll was 86. Mir was 86 to 2000. So yeah, I was there yeah. for that. I, yeah. I was so focused on astronomy that manned space flight didn't exist in my reality. Yeah. Um, but that happens, and you uh, outgrow it. Yeah, and so I started Universe Today in 99, so we reported on the on the deorbiting in 2000, which was yeah. pretty cool. Cool. Okay, great. Well, so we'll talk, to you. we'll talk to you next week, Pamela. Sounds great, Fraser. Talk to you later. Okay, now don't hang up. We're just going to stop our recordings and then take questions. And I am going to reopen Twitter. All right. Um. And I'm using two monitors, so that's why you see me looking all over the place.
Me too. I want six monitors. My video card can handle six monitors. I want to do that. I want to build a great big rack of six monitors. Kyle is up to five on his. Yeah. It looks like flight control. It's awesome. really insane. I love it. Maybe one really big one and then sort of off to the side and one up above with Twitter going and all kinds of stuff. That'd be great. All right. Um, all right. Good. Well, I'm safe. Okay. I am I'll put too. this into the upload just to make sure that it gets to Preston. Um, good. And then what's your schedule this week? Maybe... Um, Thursday, we may be able to record again. Tomorrow, um, I'm okay. I'm working on. Okay. Uh, do you want to tentatively? Special, sure. Do you want to so. tentatively aim for maybe Thursday? Yeah, that sounds okay. good. We'll sounds we'll great. set up a time later today. Okay. Um, okay. And anyone watching now, if you want to have some questions, that would be uh, that would be good. Uh, so Michael Jobin is noting that Skylab did not have a resupply provision. Um, Guido Bieber is asking, would you be able to see Salyut and Skylab stations from the ground today just like ISS? I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, we totally. See... You can see anything yeah. if you know where to look and have the right telescopes. Well, not even that. I mean, we see satellites heading overhead. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you yeah, go I, night... I got one last night in my picture of the crescent moon. Just a five-second exposure. There's this little sad streak going across. Uh, yeah, so so absolutely, you would have been able to see it, and you know, same thing. I mean, you know, there wasn't an internet that you could use to to find the positions like we can today. So you would have to. I'm not even sure how you would have known when to look. Um, yeah, pre-internet. Well, I know ham radio operators have been doing this for ages. Um, so I suspect just like ham radio operators have been monitoring. Uh, spacecraft ever since right. Sputnik that ham radio operators would similarly work to distribute that information through varieties of, of methods. Good um, point. Yeah. Ham radio operators have been doing internet-like stuff for a long time manually. It's really kind of awesome. Yeah. I mean, ham, it's fun. It's interesting, like a lot of astronauts were also ham radio people as well. And so there's, I know there's examples of like ham radio operators talking with space station people and, and space shuttle people yeah. through the ham radios. Like yeah, if you... it, it's, it's really awesome. They were ham radio operators. They were typically Boy Scouts and they were often from the Midwest. <laughs> uh, so if you want to talk to a, and even now, I think... You know, I've heard of people getting a chance to talk to astronauts and stuff using using yeah. ham radios. So it's a if you want to talk to astronauts, become a ham radio operator. It's a great, uh, great backup technology. Or or do a live hangout on Google Plus with them, which they did just a <laughs> couple of months ago. Well, there there is some sci-fi so show really I cool want to say that um, that used uh, ham radio to contact. Someone up on on the space station. I want to say maybe it was even um, that that new show that has the little kid that communicates the numbers. I can't remember the name of it. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking no, about. No, it's you a gone TV crazy? show. It's on Hulu. That's okay. all I know. Um, uh, Thomas Trenaker has mentioned that you should see a power grid control station. It looks like Houston Control. Uh, on my awesome road trip just a couple of weeks ago, we actually went to NASA JPL, and that was a lot of monitors. That was amazing to stand up in the above the control room and see where they controlled the Curiosity landing and 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 stuff. That was amazing. That's a lot of monitors. Yeah. That's what I want. <laughs> um, Pitt Corby says, you should do an episode about the popularization of science and how the communication of science to the public has changed and evolved through the history, not just in the recent decades. That's interesting. You know, if you want to be a science popularizer back in, say, the Renaissance, then they would uh, uh, threaten to kill you and confine you to house arrest. Uh, you <laughs> that know. wasn't entirely true. <laughs> right? It was more a matter of if you tick off the Pope, pope by... Yeah. By by being rude to him publicly, he will yeah. attack you and blame your science for the reason right. he's attacking and you. Can. Read and Galileo's can. daughter if you want to understand what Galileo um, did. Wrong. Right, but then you know, back in Carl Sagan's day, science popularization was seen as a waste of time and even kind it of largely insulting. still is. It's seen as a waste of time. Okay, by right. a lot of people still. Right. Yeah. 
um, and seen as a sort of, uh, um, yeah, as a waste of time and, you know, denigration of science. And well, how it's, it's, it's scientists... mostly just seen as if you're a good scientist, why would you waste your time communicating instead of just doing science? Yeah. And those yeah. who communicate science aren't real scientists. Right. Um, I get told I'm not a real scientist on a fairly regular basis. Oh, that's so mean. On a regular basis, you're told yeah. that you're not a real scientist. Yeah. Oh. I publish. Oh, I publish you papers. Publish. Really. Yeah. Hello. We have an army of uh, of of people helping us out on on doing research, and it's going to real it's, papers. And it's just bias. I mean, it's yeah. it's one of those unfortunate realities where. Um, it's it's a complex situation of of biases and um, yeah it's 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 just biases it's that yeah. simple. Well, I mean, for you and I, it's it's very different, right? Because for for from my perspective, I mean, University Today has always been a you know a commercial entity, and yeah. so you know, there's no. The demand is there for the science popularization, and so I'm able to have a job doing it. And and the the people reading it look at the ads, and that pays for the for what what we're able to do, and and that's perfect. I think with with science for a lot of scientists though, they forget that the money that they're using to to do their research is coming from the public, is coming from public entities, and the it's in the interests of the public whether or not this these things are going to get funded. So there's a real value to to talk to sort of communicate back with the public about about what's going on. So they understand the things they're investing in for the future. So And and I I really think that one of the problems we're dealing with and this is very much a generational problem. Younger people very much understand the need to communicate um, comparatively compared to older generations. Uh, it, it's very much a matter of, well, communications is something for somebody else to do. Um, you don't see this as much in foreign countries necessarily, but here in North America, um, the, the concept of you hire someone to do your EPO, the scientists should simply go in and give lectures now and then, but but the real communication of science should, should get left for someone that just does that. And there's actually an unfortunate um, trend that's finally stopping of just giving it to departmental secretaries to go do. Right. So that, that's the level of, of how much it was demeaned as a profession. Do you think that... Uh, can, okay. Um, Right. So do you think that things are changing though? I mean, you look at the popularization now. I mean, there's shows like The Universe and there's Cosmos and there's the new Cosmos coming back and and I think that there's a tremendous amount of of interest on on YouTube and things places like that for science related information. And especially I, I think the public stuff, right? the public desperately hunger for it. The problem that we run into is uh the, the public don't always let their voice be known when it comes to how we should spend money. And if NASA is going to be forced by the U.S. Office of Management and Budgets to remove education public outreach funding from its missions, that's a clear message that it is considered a waste of scientists' time and a waste of NASA money to do education. And and this is going to unemploy scientists. Mm -hmm. um, one of the telecons I was on last week when bluntly asked should we all start looking for new jobs, the answer was don't turn down one if you see it. <laughs> wow. And, and yeah, I'm still processing this which is why I haven't blogged about yeah. it because yeah. I wanted to be able to blog rationally. Yeah. Now you um... Uh, Sylvan Westby is mentioning that you wrote a blog post about the funding of science in the light of popularization from King's Pet to crowdfunding. That's what he says. Yes, uh, over on the Global Astronomy Month blog. Yeah, how long ago did you do that? I, I did that, I believe, last Thursday night in the middle of the night. Um, it, it was something that I'd struggled with for a while, so I discussed not the, the specifics of what's going on right now, with, which are personally quite terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the thing with astronomy is historically 
professional astronomers have been the pets of kings. There, there have been royal astronomers. There have been uh, astronomers who had patrons who funded them, who provided them housing. They lived in the castles. Uh, but, but over time, the number of astronomers has increased, which I'm a fan of because I sort of kind of almost maybe temporarily have a job. Uh, but one of the things is that as governments have needed more and more big science done, the Manhattan pro Project, the V2 in Germany, uh, the large accelerators all around the world, um, these large projects which benefit entire nations, benefit entire societies, and with some projects like CERN benefit the whole world, Governments have seen the need to fund these as something necess that's necessary. But with the economic downturn that is also a global phenomena, we see austerity measures in Europe, we see sequestration, sequestration measures in the United States, and as near as I can tell, these are the same things, just different multisyllabic words. Um, one of the results of, of governments running out of money is is science is one of the first things to get cut yeah and and that's what we're facing yeah and that's the future i mean the thing is like we look at all this wonderful stuff that we have surrounding us all this amazing technology internet uh cellular phones hard drives i mean just lasers all this amazing gps all this amazing technology at some point somebody had to do basic research and say you know, what is this radiation? Where is this going? How do we calculate time more correctly? And eventually, <clears throat> these things are turned into the kinds of, of devices and, you know, so solutions the, the that enrich our lives, right? When, one of the problems is, is communicating this effectively to the U.S. government. I, I was lucky enough to get to testify before a Senate subcommittee hearing back in 96, where... Um, I was one of three students that was testifying at, at a hearing about the necessity of funding basic research, and it was university presidents, it was leading researchers, it was Nobel laureates, and us three students. And, and I, I th think I was third to last to speak, because I was the youngest of the three students, and they put us last for obvious reasons, because if you run out of time, you get rid of the students. students. Yep. Um, and... As, as I watched all the presentations, I became somewhat horrified because I'd written my presentation entirely from the heart. We do science because we love it. It's our dream. This is our career. Funding basic research allows us to, to creatively expand the future. Um, and everyone else was talking in dollars and numbers and, and graphs. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have no numbers in my talk. And and. I, I went with what I'd written. I, I spoke entirely from the heart. And one of the things that inspired me to keep being a communicator of science um, was John Glenn was one of the senators who was, who was in that hearing. And in his closing remarks, he scolded the entire room to take a look at that little girl over there, and I was that little girl. Aww. And, and he encouraged everyone to learn to speak from the heart. And as long as we have our top researchers, when they're asked to testify, testifying in numbers and charts, it's harder to communicate people who aren't science literate and in some cases aren't even math literate. Yeah. Um, our, our Senate, they're representatives of America, which means most of them aren't going to, to have advanced degrees, uh, at least not in the sciences and technology and math. And, and so we need to learn to communicate with the same passion, the same emotion that, that you see from so many other anti-science lobbying groups. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're, we're out of time, uh, 1.06, so why don't, we, uh, why don't we wrap this up? So we'll, we'll talk maybe Thursday. And everyone out there in Boston, be safe and call your loved ones and let them know you're okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for watching.